So good morning. Good morning. Uh, well, warm welcome to everyone to today's event. Uh, we are grateful for the opportunity even accorded to us by Arako Academy to come together today to celebrate the International Women's Day. And um, on that note, I'd like to warmly welcome all of us, all of those who are joining us um, online. Uh, welcome. So my name is Dorothy uh, Kahenya, and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, our panelists, our guests, and those who are going to be sharing with us their expertise on this field. And to begin with, I would like uh, us to wish if there's a lady seated next to you or standing, uh, you could wish her a happy International Women's Day, a personalized happy International Women's Day. Thank you, thank you. So to begin our program, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Michael Kimwele, who's going to give us the opening remarks. Dr. Kimwele is the Director, School of Community. Most welcome, Dr. Kimwele. So thank you very much, Dorothy, Dorothy, and everyone for this opportunity. So I would want, once again would want to wish every other lady in the world happy International Women's Day. So women are the backbone of everything in our country and the world. Without them, we wouldn't be in existence. So it's a great moment for everybody. So protocols observed, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my pleasure to be here today during this year's International Women's Day with our partners here at Oracle, where we are celebrating an event with the theme, the role of ICT in gender equality today for sustainable tomorrow. I'm happy that Oracle Academy has over the years continued to support mentor and train many professionals who are now serving in different capacities of the nation's economy. Oracle Academy, together with institutions of higher learning like ours, in this country continue to play a significant role in the training and providing opportunities for highly trained human capital in the fast growing economy. Empowering individuals like what Oracle Academy is doing the relevant skills for the digital world is key for them to fully participate in today's and tomorrow's economic, social, and cultural life. The evolving nature of the digital economy requires individuals to rapidly adjust to shifts in skills, demands, and technology. A great emphasis should be placed on ensuring that individuals are equipped with strong foundation skills, higher order thinking competencies, as well as social and emotional skills to respond to greater levels of uncertainty. In addition, digital literacy is essential to ensure inclusion in the digital economy and society. In fact, ICT might be the most tangible tools we have right now to fight gender discrimination. The challenge of building a, so, a social model based on gender equality should for now go hand in hand with targeted efforts to expand women's, women's access to and the use of ICT as a way to democratize information, communications, and the participation of women, the generation of knowledge. ICT enables women to play an active role in development support and dissemination networks. They also provide women with access to new jobs and professions, to, particip to participation in the interactive learning and information initiatives, and to knowledge and information for empowerment and for improving their lives. These technologies help women take their place in the public space of the information society. 
creating resources, contributing ideas and opinions, and capitalizing on their in in inventiveness and creativity. For those who are working to help overcome the problems arising from gender inequality, there is no replacement for women's access to knowledge and ICT. For women, as we celebrate today's event, such access is crucial to changing their lives, just like any other person, holding their destiny and participating in development. The discussion about women's access to and use of digital, digital ICT in developing, developing countries has been inconclusive so far. Some claim that women are rather technophobic and that men are much better users of digital tools. The pervasive and persistent stereotype is that women are at a natural disadvantage to benefit from the digital revolution because they are less tech savvy, they are afraid of technology, and because technology is not built for their needs and intuition. If this were the case, the increasing socioeconomic importance of ICT would add a new dimension to the already existing vicious circle between the traditional and long-standing discrimination of women in fields like employment, income, education, and health, and women's chances to improve on this situation in the digital age. On the contrary, others argue that women enthusiastically embrace digital communication. Digital technologies are proven to be practical and tangible tools for women to improve their conditions. ICT can help women to gain employment, for example, through telework, which most people nowadays are doing, working from home, or newly created information jobs. It can also help them obtain cost-effective health services and education, such as online courses or software-based literacy programs. And to increase their income, such as through e-business channels and online transactions. In my own view, ICT per se does not have anything on women that might keep them and the girls from using it in developing countries. Notwithstanding, women continue to be discriminated in many other aspects of social life, including employment, literacy, and income. These inequalities also throw their shadows on ICT usage. However, once having access to ICT, this vicious cycle can be turned into an opportunity. And this is what we should move forward to providing our women with. Where they identify positive attitudes of women towards ICT, enable them to circumvent and fight existing inequalities. Given that, being a woman is very useful when living in the digital age. If they could be provided with these technologies, they could access employment, increase their income, and improve access to education and health. These might, might be the most tangible tools we have right now to assist them in fighting gender discrimination. It is also a proactive tool Women can bootstrap themselves out of discrimination if they use it appropriately. Therefore, public access, especially combined with special provisions for women, for example, a lady discount if you walk into a place where you want to buy something, ladies discount time slots, like if you are teaching, you may give preference to your female students to be served at a certain time, this might turn out to be very useful. Once policymakers realize that women are starting to the digital age in an unfavorable condition, but they could make the biggest contributions to an human society, they will dedicate more resources to help address one of the millennium development goals that the world is still having serious problems with, gender equality and the empowerment of women. In closing, I would want to, I would like to wish all of you the best in your deliberations today. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kimwele, for reminding us the, uh, the key role that women play in this society today, and also reminding us that um, ICTs have a great potential to be a great enabler and empowerment of women. So next, I'm going to welcome Dr. Chemwa. He's going to give us our, some welcoming remarks. Karibu, Dr. Chemwa. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of uh, Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, I'd like to thank you, Director Dr. Kimwele, and uh, every person who has made it to our meeting today. I would like to thank Oracle Corporations uh, for organizing this event for us today, because we know that um, our sisters and our mothers uh, form a very important uh, part of our community. And just to echo what our director said, without them, all of us will not be here today. So um, I would like to welcome everybody to this event. I believe everything we're going to discuss today is going to uh, contribute towards creating more space for women in ICT and also ICT in Africa bringing equality, uh, one more step towards uh, gender equality in Africa. Thank you very much and may God bless everybody as we proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chemwa. Dr. Chemwa is a lecturer in the Department of Computing and is also the JKU at Oracle Program Coordinator. So he has been key in ensuring that this event take off and we are grateful for this opportunity for that. Uh, a, a quick reminder of our theme today, it's the role of ICT on gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. Towards that also, we are celebrating the International Women's Day today. It's a day set aside to celebrate the work and milestones for women and how women are shaping the ecosystem. In our case today, we celebrate the work and milestones of women in technology and how women are shaping the ecosystem in that sector. Towards this, I'd like to welcome uh, our first presenter today, joining us all the way from uh, is it Nigeria? Uh, Ms. Bekere Amasoma, the Oracle Academy Program Manager. She's joining us online for our presentation. So I'd like our technical team to facilitate that for us, please. Welcome, Ms. Bekere Amasoma. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Can I confirm you can hear me, please? Can I confirm you can hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Okay, please enable me to share my screen. So Sorry? I, I need to share my screen, please. Can they make me co-host so that I can share? Okay, kindly technical team.
try the carry. Good, you can see it, isn't it? That's it. Okay, welcome. Kindly unmute. Unmute, please. You can possible to unmute for all. Okay. okay. Ask her to unmute. Kindly unmute so that we can hear you. Could you type it in? Could you type to her message? You've communicated? Okay, we still there. Okay, so I'd like to request um, Ms. Bekele whether we can go on with Marion, even as uh, the issue with her audio is being sorted out, if that's okay. Ms. Bekele Amasoma. Okay, I'd like to welcome Marion Karanja. She's the Principal Technology Solution Engineer at Oracle Kenya to, uh, to give us her presentation, even as we await for audio uh, to, uh, sought out by um, uh, Ms. Bekere. So, Karibu Sana Marion Karanja. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I hope internet doesn't disappoint in this era of technology, working from home. Of course, we have a lot of issues going on. So first of all, thank you. And I am very honored and I feel happy today to be celebrating International Women's Day. Of course, the theme of breaking the bias is something that I am passionate about. And um, I just can't wait to share uh, how we've experienced this, how sometimes we have unconscious bias 
and how it affects all of us. So to introduce myself, uh, as you've heard, I'm Marion Karanja. I am a technology, a principal technology solutions engineer at Oracle Kenya. Um, I have over eight years experience that's in digital and technology transformation. And I work, I have been in the ICT industry, telecommunication services, mobility enterprises, renewable energy, and management consulting. So despite the fact that I am a developer at heart, and I love that a lot, uh, in my previous roles, uh, they've given me the opportunity to lead high-performing teams and work with amazing individuals each and every day um, across the continent. And before joining Oracle, I led technology in a management consulting uh, company across its four African countries. That was Kenya, Uganda, Zambia, and Nigeria. So the best part about my job and something that I love talking about is the fact that I break down those difficult technology uh, concepts and I make them easily relatable to the people that I work with. And as I do that, I'm able to um, ensure that I'm creating value for the businesses that I work with. And um, that's just basically who I am. It's first of all, talking to JQuart is something that is close at heart. Reason being, I did graduate from JQuart. I was, uh, I did telecommunication engineering. So I was in the school of electrical engineering and um, it brings back the memories of being in a class full of men. And sometimes um, I think that's where for me breaking the bias really was because my classmates didn't look at me like a lady. I, I felt more of a boy with them and it was good because we competed at a level playing field. Um, and so now I just wanted to, to talk about bias. I, I wish I was there and I hope I was there to do this uh, physically. But the first thing is the stories that we have. We all have stories, especially women in technology or anyone else. I'm just from a session whereby someone talked about an unconscious bias whereby this gentleman, she ordered food uh, from Globo and this gentleman brought it to the, her house. And what happened was the gentleman had very good English. It was like, what are you doing driving a motorbike? It, it was not about driving the motorbike. It's just that she didn't think someone with that sort of English who was very eloquent could be doing deliveries. But the gentleman was actually doing it for fun because he enjoyed doing it. And that's a form of unconscious bias that we literally, we have day in, day out, yeah? So for me, especially being a woman in tech, having graduated in engineering, I think my first bias was when I was, I wanted to go in and climb a uh, telecommunication mast. I think we've all seen them, Safaricom and other places. They have those huge masts, yeah? And I was told, Marion, you shouldn't be doing that. You're a, you're a lady. Ah, man. That was really disheartening because this is something I was doing and something that I really loved. So that's the first experience I would say for bias. And that's the reason because I was brought up in a way that there was no bias, yeah? How my brother was treated is the same way I was treated. And so that, the fact that that changed at that point and I had had stories made me feel like it was not fair. And that happens a lot, especially in, techno in technology careers. And so today when we're looking at breaking the bias in technology careers, the big question is how can we do this? And what should we be looking out for? The first thing is being very intentional. As men, as women, we need to be very intentional about breaking this bias. Looking around the room and seeing the same person despite their race, despite their gender, despite where they come from and treating them equally. It's very difficult because sometimes I personally will enter a room and if I meet another lady in tech, I will want to get, you know, get all bubbly and approach them fast. But we are all here on the level play, uh, playing field and on the same table. One of the books that I just read um, last year was Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. And it's because I felt like I was pulling myself back and waiting for people to invite me at the table. And that's what I want to bring out today. There are women and there are people, women, men, who are waiting for people to invite them to the table. 
that will never happen. And we've had people talk about this day in, day out. So how do we break that bias? How do we break the barriers? Someone once told me that if you always wait for people to come to you, you will really never, you will never achieve the, the, your potential because you will be limited. So one thing is always put your head, your name in the heart. Because when your name is in the heart, what happens is that someone will come in and someone will pick that name, and the name will be read out. It's a chance. No one will ever know who you are unless you go in and put your name there. So women who are developers, men who are developers, I'm kind of leaning towards women because it's International Women's Day, but no one is going to invite you. And we have to be very deliberate about doing that, like not having the imposter syndrome and thinking that we can't make it. We can. There's, there's a reason why I was able to go through school and, and emerge out of that and get jobs out of um, everywhere else. Like you get a job because you apply for it. So the first thing we need to do is being able to put your name in that heart and put yourself out there. Rejection comes, rejection goes, but you still remain at the top of it. And this is some conversation that I have with people. And when we're talking, the first thing I'll ask is, what's the worst that could happen? They will say no. And if they say no, we continue. That's just it. So today, as we break the bias, is also breaking the bias that we have against ourselves, where we start feeling like we are not worth it. So, and we'll do this by ensuring that we are able to put up our names in that hat. I don't know, I can't see people, but those who are online, if you can raise your hands, I'll be very happy to see you do that. Raise your hand and say that today, I do break this bias and I am going to put myself out there. I'm going to put my name in that heart so that I can be picked. So if you pledge to do that, please raise your hand. And I hope people in the room are also raising their hands. Yes, Calvin, thank you for pledging to break this bias. That's the first thing. The other thing as we continue, remember no one is going to invite you to the table. So the first thing we've talked about breaking the bias is ensuring that we put our name in there. And this is bias in technology careers, but I know we might be diverse, so I'll, I'm putting it out there. The other thing is never stop learning. So there's one thing, and it was very intentional, and I want to share this story is, I wrote down companies that I wanted to work for. This was in 2021, beginning of 2021. And I wrote in, so there was company one, company two, and company three was Oracle. Yeah. I looked at it and I asked myself, what would get me to Oracle? So I went, I did my research. Already, I had my technology degree and career. What else did I need? And I started looking at certifications. And I realized that you never stop learning. The profiles I was seeing online on LinkedIn of people who were in Oracle basically were people who had certain skill set. And so I started doing that. I started, I went back to school and then I decided I also wanted to have another language. So I enrolled also in French and I was telling myself it's about developing myself and ensuring I am the best. Because at that point, when you are when your heart is there, when, sorry, when the heart is there and your name is in the heart, it's people picking your name and you have to be worth of the position that is going to be advertised or is going to be put out there. And so continuous development and the fact that we never stop learning is very important because if we are asking people and we are asking one another to break this bias, we need to be worthy and we need to be able to stand out and say that we can do this and we are qualified to do this. Yeah, I hope I'm speaking to someone. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens when you're online. And finally, I want to talk about embracing change and growth. 
each and every moment, we need to push ourselves. We need to push ourselves because there's change. And we need to be able to recognize that we are good enough to be, to take up positions of leadership, uh, to be able to assist others and also pull them up where we can. So that intentionality about breaking the bias and working with someone is something that will help, especially in breaking the barrier in technology careers. And I'm saying this because um, I, I mentioned that last year I wrote down the companies. And as I was doing that, being intentional about my growth, what I did was um, come out and look for people who I wanted, who I wanted to be like. So I wanted to approach these people as to be my mentors. So I picked out a few names. I reached out on LinkedIn and everywhere else I could find them, WhatsApp. And surprisingly, no one picked me out and I, I needed to walk this journey alone. Well, everyone would think, yes, Marion's got it. No, every time Marion also has that enough thing that tells her, Marion, you're not worth enough. So I thought having someone would work for me and I knew it would, but that didn't materialize. But that didn't mean that I will never do that to someone. This year I became intentional. And I decided I was going to pick people who wanted to work with me and I would work with them because I would like someone's journey to be easier. Someone to know what to expect and someone to like brand themselves and do something that is extraordinary. So today as women, as men, let us be intentional about working with other people, embracing change and growth and pulling up other people that we're working with. So I can continue talking a lot and I am really, really, um, I, I, I feel like this is something that is close to me. Of course, when you're talking about International Women's Day and breaking the bias and we all can do it. I see Vekere is back. Thank you very much, Vekere. I'm just finishing this. I, I can't <laughs> even believe we are both pokering. I know. <laughs> Yes, yes, I, I know. And I, I feel like we should be in the room, but I'm very happy and I'm very excited that today I get to celebrate this day with other women and breaking the barriers. If I can, everyone can, and we are going to work together. Thank you very much. I think I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Makara. And thank you, Jake Watts. Let's clap for Marion, please. Thank you so, so much, Marion, for those insights. We've learned a lot compressed in very few minutes. I think we should come over one of these findings and spend some time with us. We'd like to learn more from that. Definitely. I would love to. Thank you so much. Um, so next we are going to have a, a presentation from um, Janet Kamau. Uh, Janet Kamau is the marketing director, Oracle Africa. Welcome, Janet. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Marion, that was um, an excellent uh, session. Really appreciate. Uh, mine this morning is just to give a few words um, and maybe just talk about uh, what is bias. Uh, and, and I don't know what our understanding of bias is, but I can assure you that uh, as many as we are in this room, 18 plus the ones that are watching on YouTube, those are how many kind of biases uh, that, that we have. And I'm going to show you some examples. Um, but before we start, um, allow me also to just briefly talk about uh, Oracle. We have what we call Oracle Women Leadership, which we call OWL in short. Um, and during this day, we do celebrate uh, International Women's Day. And the role of OWL, uh, which I believe we also have um, uh, in the organization, is to develop and engage and empower the future generation of women leaders. So all the women leaders, all the women in this, uh, you know, in, in, in this YouTube or, you know, in, in the webinar, feel free to always, you know, come back to Oracle and we, you know, when you're applying for jobs, let Oracle be your number one place that you want to, uh, to look for. Um, in terms of bias, so what is bias? I know we've got some, you know, bias comes in different uh, forms, but there are two main ones. There's conscious bias and there's unconscious bias. So conscious bias refers to, you know, the, the, the bias attitudes that you are aware of, you know, you're aware of and you're doing them um, and you're doing them intentionally. 
unconscious bias are the ones that are uh, that operate outside your awareness. You're not aware of them. And when you do them, you're not aware that you're actually being biased uh, to, towards someone, yeah? So there's no malicious intent when you're actually doing it. Uh, while unconscious bias, it is, you know, there's a malicious, um, you know, intent uh, when it comes to that. And the various forms of, the most common ones that we know are race, gender, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation or educational background or social economic background. Those are the main common uh, sort of characteristics of, of, of bias. But this morning, I want us to sh I want to show you just a few uh, examples of, 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 of what, what happens. And let if you allow me to share my, my, my slide. Um, if, if you look at this, I just went, I just Googled, and you can Google. When you search for the name uh, nurse, this is what comes out. So everyone thinks that a nurse should be female. When I Google surgeon, everyone assumes that a surgeon should be male. Now, that is how our biases begin. And you know what? These biases begin when we are young. Uh, in fact, it is said that biases get into someone when they are five or six years. So we need to start shaping them, uh, you know, for the girls who are young to know that, yes, you can also be surgeons, uh, for the guys who are young, that you can be a nurse. Really, the, the, the opportunities that are out there are open uh, to everyone. I have a video to share. Um, but before I go to that video, let, let's look at the one from that we also from, from Kenya Airways. There's a guy who posted and said, who's the pilot of this bird? Because I'm proud of him. Yeah. So everyone assumed that whoever landed that pilot, that uh, that plane at Heathrow when there was a lot of wind must have been a guy. But KQ responded and said, actually, the person who flew it was a lady and her name was Captain Ruth Karuri. So sometimes we all have those kind of uh, biases. Uh, and it's not just the person who posted this, but even us, even I have, you know, in, in the past had my own biases to, uh, to someone, and I'm sure we all can, can attest to that. Um, I have a very interesting uh, video. Let me share it with you, um, and we can then pick a few things from that. Let me know if you can hear it. Different jobs and the first job we're going to draw Sorry, let me is that it. Okay. this afternoon we're going to draw people doing different jobs and the first job we're going to draw is a firefighter okay. have a think in your head what a firefighter looks oh, like you what's your firefighter called mine's called firefighter gary firefighter star <laughs> firefighter simon he's big and strong he's got a big helmet on that's brilliant, isn't it? Next, we're going to draw a surgeon. Have you thought of a name for your surgeon? Jim Bob. Jim Bob. He's a brain surgeon. I think he would wear a stethoscope. He gives you medicine. That's his ambulance. OK, next, we're going to draw a fighter pilot. Yes. This is his jet plane. He rescues people. He likes to do stunts in the air and stuff. OK, now, who would like to meet these people for real? Yeah. My name's Tamsin and I'm a surgeon in the NHS. My name's Lauren and I'm a pilot in the Royal Air Force. My name's Lucy, I'm a firefighter in the London Fire Brigade. So who wants to know how to do an operation? <gasps> Who's putting on? I'm trying my stethoscope. Can we put this in here? What does it look like? There you go. Now you're a proper fighter pilot. So into your ears. Can you hear that? Yeah. It's really Lager good. It's much better, yeah. yeah. It's much better than my kids' Lager one. Lager Okay, I don't know what your views are on, on, on that. Let me play you one more. Um, sorry, let me get this out of the way. Over 45 won't have enough money. Oh. Sorry. Okay, let me know when you can view it. Father and son yeah. are driving a car. 
they get into a car accident. A dad dies. The son gets rushed into A and E. Yeah. The surgeon says, "I cannot operate. This is my son." Who's the surgeon? Oh my gosh! Well, it could be his biological father because he's adopted. The father of the boy. A ghost. A priest. The surgeon's the dad. The father. The father has died, so yeah, <laughs> can't be the father. It's down to God to say. God. The wife had an affair with the surgeon. Either his stepfather or biological father. His brother. The surgeon's the mother. <gasps> oh my God! Yes, it makes so much sense. Like, Damn! Ah, oh, that's so annoying. <laughs> that's that's terrible, isn't it? Oh. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> oh my gosh! Ah, <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, yeah, obviously, and we all automatically assume that the surgeon's a man. Great. Uh, who would like us to Who would like to give us some thoughts on that? Just one. One person only is good enough. Otherwise, I'll pick on you, Bekere. What are your thoughts on that? Bekere, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Jill. Um, mm. uh, Jane. So, so there's a lot of stereotypes. Uh, <laughs> I, I know this, especially even around here in Africa, right? So women are supposed to be matched to some kind of job. So women have should have more caring jobs, like being nurses that may be averse to blood, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and all of that. Then the men should take up the more engineering or the firefighting roles. And, uh, and, and I feel that, yes, while some jobs, you know, maybe could be dangerous to women, but still allow us the opportunity, right, to, to, to do those jobs. Because, yeah, climbing on masts, like Myra wanted to, that she was discouraged, could be a bit dangerous. Yes, we know. We have grown lion hearts these days as women we want to explore all of it. Do not limit us in any way. Let, allow us, you know, do these things and fulfill well, it's fine, but don't deprive us at all of, of doing them. So yeah, that, that was one of my key takeaways. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bekere. And and actually you, you've summed up my message on, on what is bias and how can we break it. Um we, we all have roles that we can play. Um, and, and as long as we give that, those equal roles uh, to people, then I think that that is what is more important. And, and also that we all have this unconscious bias. All of us, uh, we have unconscious bias. Uh, sometimes we realize it, sometimes we don't realize it. I think the important part is, are we, can, can we now start being aware of, uh, of those things? If I look at Bekere, what do I think of Bekere? If I look at Marion, what do I think of Marion? Um, you know, just being aware of those kind of um, unconscious biases and how they impact uh, on how we interact with others or how we, how we pursue our education and so on and so forth. So I wish you all, uh, the ladies who are here, a happy International Women's Day. It's really great to see all the men that are on the webinar. I can see Shem, Geoffrey, Kevin, Calvin, Isaac, Lawrence, really great to have you guys because without you, I mean, women cannot stand. We need each other, the men and the women together we stand. So thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to be, to celebrate with you this day. Thank you. Um, whom do I off hand over to, Bekere? I need over to Dorothy. So okay. Dorothy is supposed to come up. Okay. He's here. Thank you so much, uh, Janet, uh, for that interesting presentation. It was interesting to see the look on the faces of those young ones when they realized that an, uh, a firefighter can be a lady, a surgeon can be a lady. And I think those are some of the biases that you're talking about that even us in our homes, we can help to uh, eliminate. So next, I'm going to be calling um, Ms. Bekele for your presentation, please. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me now? That's okay. Okay, great. Um, thank you, everyone. I hope I can do this quickly in about 10 to 15 minutes because I've already shot time. My name is Bekiria Basuma and I am the Oracle Academy Program Manager for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this morning, 
I, I wish I could talk about, you know, the bias and everything going on, but I think that my colleagues, Janet and um, Marion have done enough justice to it. And we still have a panel session coming up again. So I, I think I will share my thoughts at that point. But today, at this time, allow me introduce you uh, or refresh, uh, you know, do a refresher sort of, of uh, our offerings and what we do at the Oracle um, Academy. This presentation mode. Okay, great. Um, the Oracle Academy is Oracle's global philanthropic program in education, and we seek to advance computing education globally to increase knowledge, skills development, innovation, and diversity, which is why we're here this morning. This is a diversity event um, for us, and that is what we seek uh, to, to promote. Now, Oracle Academy is totally free of charge to institutions, to teachers, and to students. Right, it is at no cost, and we have been able to engage with thousands of educational institutions across 128 countries, counting um, across the globe. And we've been able to help millions of students to become college and career uh -huh. by giving them resources, um, that, by giving them um, handsome practice in industry relevant um, technologies. So we have been supporting education since 1993. And like I said, we have partnered with over 15,000 schools across the globe. Now, this is free of charge, like I said, for students, teachers, and to schools. And those are like our core, you know, audience that's that's who we are for we are for teachers we are for schools and we are for um for 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 students so for for the other guys who are out of school or in between jobs there are other oracle um programs who cater to those uh, to that segment now what do we offer what 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 do our resources include so we include we we have membership so our, our membership comes in two forms we have either the institutional membership or the faculty membership so by institutional membership i mean that jquat has its own membership irrespective of the teachers that are in jQuad. So for instance, we understand that as career mobility, people may need to move for better opportunities. Um, so if a teacher, you know, opens an account on the JQuad and he moves to another school, JQuad account still remains so that the next teacher can come in and continue the membership of JQuad, right? And also faculty membership. This means that individual teachers can join in into the program and they get access to all of the resources that are available. Another resource that we have available is the curriculum and tools. Now we have a full curriculum in database, we have in data science, there's Java curriculum, there's cloud computing, there's project management. And um, on the Sonder cloud computing, we recently introduced the Oracle cloud infrastructure. Um, foundation one course, but we also added foundations two course for those who are interested in uh, implying the cloud um, computing pathway. And also when anyone, students or teachers get to um, complete a course, a self-taught course in our, in, in our member hub, they get a certificate of completion, right? So also, in addition to membership and curriculum that we provide to members, we also provide cloud environments um, that are provided for teaching database and application development. So we have the job, we also have Java development environments such as Eclipse and NetBeans, Alice Greenfield, you know, which are taught to younger children. Now there's also the Oracle software licenses that we give for classroom teaching and not for research purposes, right? So these are um, solutions. These are software licenses that Oracle customers heavily pay for. But remember, our goal is to make our students become college and, and you know, career ready. So we're giving them this practical hands-on tools in relevant industry relevant technologies for free. So we give out licensed technology softwares like Oracle Database, there's Oracle Analytics, there's BI, um, the Solaris and there is Fusion Middleware. Then also we give out licensed application softwares like PurpleSoft, there's Cyber CRM, and there's the JD Edward Enterprise One, you know, software solution that, that is used in supply chain management 
and a lot more than these that I given. I can't capture everything in my slides, right? We also give out um, membership recognition. So we identify um, uh, members who have, you know, been using our resources um, to teach and they've gotten a lot of success stories from it. We highlight them on our global blog, right? So that everyone from across the world can see the good work that the teachers are doing in their school. So it's a win-win for both the teacher and for the school, because of course you're, you yourself as a teacher, you're getting global recognition and also your school is being spotlighted and giving global recognition as well. Um, so what's the key impact of our program. So one would ask why you guys, why is Oracle Academy doing all of this? What's the impact it's gonna have? So when we equip students and you know teachers with really industry relevant technologies, the, the, the key, a key impact for governments is that there are now more industry uh, literate students, right? Who can offer innovation in learning. So uh, something, you know, seeing this slide just brought me back to um, the, the students bootcamp we had last year with iLab Africa, we as students were taught in the space of um, five hours, and they were able to come up with solutions using Oracle Apex, right? It was really interesting for me because that was like a real life situation, a very practical session where students under five hours were able to go back and in the following week, they were able to come up with solutions. So they so they brought up solutions using Oracle Apex to build solutions across health, agriculture, um, education, around the SDG goals. And it was very, you know, interested to, to see. Um, so that's one, the records are there and um, it's, it's on our blog, actually. So that's one of the key impacts for government. And for businesses, you get new um, workers entering the job market, more skilled in latest technology. Uh, so let me also take you back to last year. I was at a conference. I think it was at the Ascenting Conference. And there, there's this official from the bank who came in to say that any of their entry-level staff, they had to train the person for six months before the person can be fully integrated into their system. Now guess what, six whole months to retrain because number one, the person doesn't have the you know, relevant uh, industry uh, uh, skills. So that's what we're trying to cut off all of those time to give these students these technologies while they're in school, give them these skills while they're in school so that they'll just go straight you know, into the job market and save all of the money and the manpower and the efforts that employers need to, you know, put into to be to make um these candidates um ready if you get what i mean of course they are, they become more industry certified and they are more tech savvy for institutions like yours um the program is free and is philanthropic we are not expecting anything in return absolutely nothing we just want you to teach these courses to these students right then you of course you have access to java database project management cloud computing curriculum and also um the the, the, the curriculum is modular in nature, it is comprehensive and modular, right? I'm going to show you later on in this presentation. And it is created by educators for educators. So we're bringing people who understand the system, not some sort of consultants from outside to come and, you know, cook up these things for teachers. Now, um, you can do, you can, uh, they are credit leveled and they are mapped to international standards. So all of the curriculum we're using to have for our members in Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, anybody across Africa is the same curriculum that is being used in Europe, in the US, in Canada, anywhere. So uh, we're creating world-class um, 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 students and teachers, right? Because of the quality of the curriculum that we're giving out. Also for students, of course, they become more confident and career ready with um, experience in current, you know, hands-on experience in current technologies. And of course they become sought after because like Myron said, she was saying something about certification when she was checking up um, our cool employees on LinkedIn. She saw that a lot of them had certifications, which is very correct. So what we also want to do is to also offer um, you know, um, I, I encourage these students to take up certifications while they're in school so that they become um, well sought after by top employers. So how do we engage people? How do we engage students? So one, one way or two ways we usually um, advise teachers to be engaged via a program is this. We, you have your already existing curriculum. We're not saying throw it away, right? 
We are saying that you can blend Oracle Academy's curriculum with your own already existing curriculum. So you can have it side by side. Or if you say, you know what, we don't want to make do with our old curriculum. We want to take more technologically advanced curriculum, like your Java or your database courses. They can be used as standalone courses because they reach the required number of a uh, minimum number of hours required to teach a course in a semester i understand that it takes about 40 hours to complete a course per semester but most of our courses are at least 90 hours so you can teach them for at least one semester or even for a session right so if you look at this diagram that i have here um i'm trying to keep the time how many minutes more do i have to be? Could you please let me know how many more minutes I have? Just drop it in the chat, I'll see it. Um, so, okay, so for, for, for students, what do they get for being for, you know, as members of Oracle Academy or student members, they get access to Oracle Cloud. They also get access to Oracle Apex. Of course, they have on-prem software then curriculum and also career learning resources. Then for teachers, what does teachers stand to gain? You get the academic curriculum, you get on-prem software. Of course, you have access to um, Oracle Academic Cloud Program, Apex, and also professional development opportunities. Um, a few of you would know that we usually have um, some instructor-led trainings that we have here at the Oracle Academy. Pre-pandemic, it used to be in class, but it's no longer in class as it is. It is now virtual, um, self-paced. Some of the courses now run as long as 18 um, weeks to complete. So yeah, because of time, I'm rushing through this, but of course I'm always available to explain further. So remember I said that the curriculum is comprehensive and it is modular. It is created for educators by educators. And we offer computing technology pathways from one semester to three full years. So this is just a secret. Let me check my time. Noted, okay. Okay, so let me move. Now for the database courses, these are the courses that we have available for the database pathway. So uh, what we usually do is that we try to start from the very basic so that people who do not even have any idea or but who have interest in study, um, you know, this concept, technology concept can come in and they can, you know, start off and build on the knowledge they have. So for the database pathway, we have the database foundations course, we have database design and programming with SQL course, there's programming with PL and SQL, and there's application development foundations course. Now, if you see at the bottom of each page uh, of each course, you're going to see the required hours, you know, the minimum hours required to put into the course to finish it. So it is you know, long enough for you to teach in a semester or a, a, a you know, an academic session, right? So um, um, pardon my voice. <laughs> I have a better voice than this. I don't know what's happening. Then for the Java courses, we have the Java Fundamentals course, the, the Java Foundations course, there's the Java Programming course, and there's the inter Artificial Intelligence with Machine Learning in Java um, course. Right, so all those you see the required number of hours there. There's 90 hours, it's 40 hours. Now let me talk about something really interesting that we just um, introduced, which is the Oracle Academy Cloud uh, program. Uh, so this is um, it gives you access to Oracle Free Cloud Tire, um, which includes the autonomous. Um, database, which is the first and only autonomous database in the world. And uh, it allows you to teach and learn in the cloud with one time classroom setup. It is very easy, you know, for you to set up your cloud accounts in Oracle um, Academy. So you just go to the member hub and you request access to the cloud account. I think Dr. Chemwa should have access. I think he has requested. I'm not sure. Um, then, of course, you have comprehensive curriculum. We start up guides for autonomous database. Then it's easy to sign up. Um, you can easily provision your student account. So it's not just for teachers alone. You can easily provision your student account in the class. And your classes will be up and running in no time. Of course, we have to do some sort of pre-validation for this request. Then that would take maybe one or two days. But after then, as long as you complete your cloud sign up, you are up and running in no time. 
Then also we gave free cloud credit, $300 free cloud credit for the first uh, 365 days. And of course you, you get to learn, build and explore for free in, um, in services like big data, Kubernetes and Java. Um, so once again, at a glance, what are the benefits for members, educational institutions and teachers? Of course, we students gain access to exclusive membership benefits. Um, so uh, most of these benefits are only available to members. So there's a sign up process, right? But you can go to our page, um, our marketing website which is academy.oracle.com. Let me just drop it in the chat, academy.oracle.com. Everyone has access to this portal, the Academy you know, marketing site, but only members would have access to the member only, only learning management system, which is called the member hub which houses all of the membership benefits. Also, we also provide support to schools, to teachers and to students. So we do not just give you um, resources and we leave it at that, no. We provide support in cases you are having issues, maybe you have issues signing up, or even if you need further explanation of some of our you know, offerings, we're always here to support you. Myself and Lona that is based in Kenya will be available to support you. And for the free access to curriculum, teaching resources and world-class technology. Um, yes, so remember I talked about the membership recognition. I talked about the curriculum we're giving out. I talked about um, the membership and also cloud environments that we're giving out for teaching. So if any of this interests you as a teacher, please reach out to me or reach out to Calvin, they'll connect you with me and sign up. Um, thank you very much. There, there's a lot more we have to offer, but as uh, you know, time would not permit, permit me for me to go into all of that. So thank you. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comment section. I will be willing to take them on. Maybe during the, um, uh, the panel session, I would also take them. So thank you very much. And over to you, Dorothy. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Becker, for that informative session. I'm sure our audience has learned a lot this. Let us give a clap. And also another clap for the other speakers that we didn't clap for. I'm sure we benefited a lot, a lot from that. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I'm going to call our next speaker, who is Dr. Agnes Mindila. She's a lecturer in the uh, School of Computing to bring us her presentation. Welcome, Dr. Agnes. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Um, I hope the media team will be able to project my presentation. Uh, my name is Agnes Mindela. I'm a faculty member here at Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology in the Department of Computing. And I'm glad to to speak to you this very important day, the International Women's Day. Uh, women are people who are, who can be the, who can be able to carry the society forward. And this morning I was just remembering the women of Ukraine, how they are moving out with the children and they are worried about their husbands who are being left to fight the war. They are worried about the children. They are worried about, you know, they were career women and all of a sudden they are not working and they are refugees. And our hearts and our prayer goes out to them that they will be able to find a footing. So today I was um, going to talk about the role of women in enhancing technology and ICT learning among women and girls for a sustainable tomorrow. So it's about women enhancing technology and ICT learning among women and girls. And uh, today 
Um, I appreciate the speakers who have already spoken ahead of me. Uh, Bekere, Marion, uh, Janet, thank you for your insights in um, informing us and, 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 and um, looking at how we can be able to break the barrier. Uh, also, thank you to Dr. Chemwa uh, and to our director, Dr. Kimwele. So I'll go straight into what I want to talk about or what I was requested to talk about. Um, and I'll start on that very first slide. Slide number one, please. Number one, where there is my picture there and the name. Yeah, that's where I see. It doesn't look like it has so much, but yet it has so much. And I know many women in tech or girls in tech uh, can be able to relate to some of the stories that I may want to tell to just that name that uh, the PhD and the senior lecturer, what it takes as a, as a, as a girl in tech or a lady in tech and just borrowing from what uh, Marion said, is that waiting to be invited to the table sometimes is very difficult. But we can be able to equip ourselves as girls, as ladies, so that we can be able to participate on that table. So I'm talking about the role of women in enhancing technology and ICT learning among women and girls. And I want to just use my experience and my experience will start from high school just to look at the women that participated in nurturing me into tech or science. And uh, the role that women teachers play in high school is quite important. And I remember in high school, I was a student who loved physics. I loved maths. And among the teachers that taught us sciences, there was this one teacher who taught us physics. And he, I was very interested in physics and I would, I, I would really ask questions. And she kept on saying, you will be an engineer. That was my teacher. And as I worked towards that and just trusting her as a woman and saying, oh, uh, she's my physics teacher and she made it to this level, I think I, I can also do it. So with her encouragement, I put in effort and actually got to be an engineer. So the role of the lady or women teachers in shaping our paths, towards tech or ICT is underlined in what they, they play at, at high school. The other women who played a great role at high school level were my peers. You know, those, 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 those if you are in a, in a girls' school, maybe you have that friend who encourages you, you know. You, you have that friend whom you can go to and discuss a subject that you think you are not so good at, but they are willing to give you a hand so that you can be able to understand better. I had one such friend, not in the same school, but a different school, a neighboring school, who had, when we would go for what we used to call maths context, you know, she will do the math so well, and she had a way of solving a problem in four or more ways. You know, she could discuss a math problem and say, you can do it this way, or you can do it in this other way, or you can do it in this other way. A perspective you might have not seen, maybe you only had one perspective, but she would be able to take you through different perspectives of solving a math problem. And so finding that one, a uh, friend who can hold your hand through the journey of uh, women in STEM or girls in STEM or girls in tech was very key 
for me in my success. And that specific friend went ahead to be a doctor. She's a doctor now. And um, another avenue that encouraged me and the rest of us who are interested in tech was when I was um, uh, in the final class from, for about to sit for exams, my school and other schools and JQUAT then, this university organized for a girls in tech uh, seminar or conference. And so we came so many of us uh, from a village school, far, far county, far from Nairobi. And we had a chance to mix with other girls who are interested in tech. And just that um, activity of being able to be brought to a place, a university, which we were all aspiring to be and seeing the magnificent of the university and how beautiful it was made us to resolve then that we must join the university. And so many of us worked hard to be able to come. So why I'm saying this is that what can we be able to, what tools can we be able to use to equip ourselves as mentors or even as uh, girls or women in tech to be able to help others or just also help yourself be able to be there. Those are some of the ways that we use. Then I want to underscore the roles of the role of mothers to their daughters in encouraging them in tech. What you tell your daughter is very important. If she's interested in tech, then tell her that she, she, she can make it, even the fathers. I want to give a story of um, uh, some women in the village where I grew up. Uh, when we grew up, uh, there was one specific girl and you know, when you grow up in a village, you know that girl from that home is in this school. There's another girl in another, in another home, in another school. So you kind of, if you are age mates, you kind of know who is in which school. So there was this one girl who had just uh, sat for her, uh, for her exams, KCSE, and she passed very well, ready to go to the university. So uh, those days, we would stay almost a whole year at home before you join the university. So within that period, uh, she got married to some young man and the women in the village were not happy. She came from a very humble family and uh, they just had a very small shamba. They used to do subsistence farming and the women in the village, including my own mom, could not take it that this girl, after performing so well and um, awaiting to go to the university, would just get married like that to a young man who seemed like he had no headway. So they went for her and picked both of them, took them to the chief, and they were very serious that our daughter cannot get married. She has to go to, to, to school. She has to go to college so that she has place those days they were administrative police. And so they told the boy they, they did not want to see him near that girl. And for sure that relationship broke. And she came to JQuart. She did her course undergraduate. She proceeded on, did her master's. And as we speak, she's in the US working as an operational engineer in some company. So the collective role of women. So I just imagine if those women had not done something, maybe we would have, we will not have the engineer that we have in her. So those are the examples of women uh, enhancing, not maybe just specifically uh, technology and ICT, but the journey in education, uh, because girls and women uh, or girls have, uh, have challenges on the way. 
On campus here, I can give an example. When I was a, stu I was a student here, I'm an alumni in the Department of Engineering. So uh, Marion, I think we were in the same department. Uh, those years, the ladies were very few. In my class, we were four, electrical engineering. We had civil engineers who had only one lady. We had mechanical engineering with no lady at all. So we found a way of coming together. We used to have common classes and we would come together just to encourage ourselves that we can make it. And there was this one lecturer who was in my department who was such an inspiration to us uh, ladies. And she would tell us, yes, you will be engineers. You know, make sure you work hard. She was a Russian lady and we all found comfort in her. So she was a lady who had gone ahead of us and she was giving us a hand as a, as a, as a lady lecturer in our department, always encouraging us, the ladies, to go on. Then I had a classmate who, when we came to first year, she got married. And those days we all stayed on campus, not like these days when students can stay outside. So when she got married, it became a challenge. So she stayed in town and she would travel from town, wherever she was staying, she would take a matatu to town and another one to do. So two matatus and our lectures would start from eight up to five. And so she would come so early. When we left the rooms and went to the lecture rooms, we found her there. And she did that for five years not getting tired. And at some point she was expected, but she still went on and went on. And she finally graduated with a BS in electrical engineering. <laughs> so despite the challenges, uh, we can be able to, to, to make it end with a little help. And I had also a friend in undergraduate who was the only lady in civil engineering so she sometimes could not find time to stay with the, 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 the men to discuss. So she would come and we would read together. I wouldn't understand her engineering. She was civil engineering and I was electrical, but there was this one unit that was um, very difficult according to her. And she spent most of the time studying that specific unit. I think it was something in structures or something. But she put in all her effort and we encourage each other. Today, she's a practicing engineer, specialized in those structures. You know, that's very specific <laughs> unit that was so difficult for her is her specialty today. And she specializes in bridges. And one of the roads that she has done is the Red Hill Road. Red Hill, the one that joins Limur Road. So every time I drive through that road, I remember Engineer Wairimo, the little girl we joined campus with, and she struggled through that specific unit is the one she's practicing. And then there are things that challenges that you have to, to, to fight along. My own dad uh, told me that, okay, you are studying engineering, but I don't think you should practice. But I said, but why? I want to practice. He said, I think you should be, maybe you should teach. I said, but why? Then, she, then, then my dad gave me, uh, his fears were about what he saw. He used to work in a company, um, a manufacturing company. And there was this young lady who had just come as a, an engineer, operations engineer, young girl. And so she was their boss. And the young lady was married and the time she reported to work, she was actually having a small baby who was breastfeeding. So, you know, the way when you are a mother and you are at work, the moment you think about your baby, you know what happens? <laughs> yeah, if you don't have good cushions, you will have the milk, you know? And so the men were like, no, 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 no. I don't think this is a good, a uh, job for, for, for ladies to be engineers because they could see what was happening. And then my dad was like, no, I don't think that is good. But 
you know, you have to, to fight that what we, we, we were saying, breaking the barriers. And so in fighting that, uh, you have to seek for help sometimes. When you need help, ask for help. Yeah, in whatever moment of your career, when you need help, ask for help. Then something else I could talk about during training, you know, it's about technology and ICT learning like Jomo Kenyatta, we have attachment uh, programs for, for, for students, which is a very good thing because attachment uh, to ladies or to girls, I think it's a time to face your fears. Yeah, or affirm that this is what you really want. Uh, because when you go out for attachment, uh, if it is in engineering or ICT or whatever field, you'll find yourself working with men. Uh, like I remember when I went for my first attachment, we used to do three attachments after second year, third year and fourth year. And so when you go, when I went for my first attachment, I found I was the only lady in the engineering department. And for electrical engineering, you always started with what we called heavy current. So you, you have your jackets there and you are trying to work on the motors and all that. And you find the whole department is just men. And so when you are walking around, all the eyes are on you. And so you wonder now, what? but you have to brave it. So you go a second time, you go a third time. And I think by the time you finish your course, you are strong enough. So thank you to JQuat who provide those opportunities so that we can be able to, to, to be strong. And then finally, when, when I finished my, my undergraduate, uh, I got married and then I was staying, uh, my neighbor, my, my former lecturer was my neighbor. And then I got expectant and then he was like, come and teach for us. I said, oh, in this condition, I don't think I should. I think I should stay on, get my baby, and then I'll come and say, no, we have a need. And that time we had diploma uh, students in the Department of Electrical Engineering and he wanted me to teach the diploma programs. And he really uh, had faith in me that I could. And so I said yes uh, to that. And I started teaching immediately after I graduated at the following year, I was teaching in this university. And I have taught all along until this time. So I got stuck in the teaching because my own lecturer had so much hope in, in me. Um, may he rest in peace, he passed on. I'll go through the next slides very quickly. Maybe you could project them for me if you could. Um, but opportunities, slide number two. Yeah, oh, that picture isn't uh, very, visible, but um, it depicts a teacher in a class and students raising their hands. And the teacher is asking who can answer this question. So the same way uh, we have done from primary school, high school, you know, when that raising up of your hand is saying, here I am, I can do it. And as girls and ladies, we ought to have the courage to just show up. You know, those little steps. Okay, you may not be sure about what, if the answer is correct, but show up by carrying up your hand. And that attitude carries on and on in every step in education for tech or for ICT. Show up, because if you don't show up, uh, nobody will know that you are there, show up. So just show up and if there is uh, help you need, ask for help. And then for the mentors, open your eyes and notice the shorter hands. You know the way our children raise up their hands. There are those who raise up their hands like that. Others, like if they're not so sure that they want to, uh, what they have in their mind is correct, but nevertheless, they are trying. So if you're a mentor at every position, whether in the industry, or in the company's place. Also, besides noticing the ones that are shooting up their hands, 
like my friend in high school who had four or more ways of solving a mathematical problem that those of us whose our hands were short because we didn't even know whether our perspective was correct, but nevertheless, <laughs> raise up your hands. So uh, show up uh, the mentors, look at those that are trying to lift up and don't leave them behind. Slide number three. Okay, so uh, women in, 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 in technology, ICT teaching, research and innovation. As, as JQuart, uh, JQuart recognizes that women play a vital role in science, technology, engineering and mathematics and the related fields, and it supports them by appointments in leadership and opportunities. So we have women in leadership in this university. Our own VC is a woman. Uh, we have various chairpersons who are women and deans, and we really appreciate that. And because we have them in those positions, then they can be able to hold their hands and pull up the rest of us to be able to, to contribute or to make our contribution in tech. And then the opportunities that come, when there are opportunities, uh, the university gives opportunities to all. I've used my own example there. That was uh, Rutlingen University in Germany. An opportunity came up for JQuart to send some two people to represent the university for a whole three weeks to be able to learn how German universities work and how they teach. And so there was um, Dr. Mubenge from Mechatronics and then I from IT, a 50-50. And I think that is a very good approach to organizations that let us be very intentional when there are opportunities in leadership or in learning, we can be able to work on 50-50 so that uh, we can equip the women mentors so that in that way we can be able to uh, support the rest. Uh, number four. Out of, out of that trip, what were the outcomes? I did follow up with one of the universities and we were able to come up with a proposal which we, we did together in collaboration, JQuart and Rainwal University. And we got funded for a research project for the design and manufacturing of assistive technologies, specifically wanting to support women scientists. So this is how the university plays a role in having women support women in ICT and tech. And so on that project, we, have, we are five ladies. We are three from, um, four from JQuart and one from Machakos University and three of the ladies are PhD students in tech. One in mechatronics, one in electrical engineering, another one in IT. So in that way, in that opportunity, we are, we are able to get funding for a research project so that again, we can equip women scientists so that when we have women scientists at that high level, PhD level, then we are sure that they can be able to go into leadership positions. And when they are in those positions, uh, we request that they can be able to lend a hand to the younger scientists that are coming up. And what else did we do? I call them sideshows but they are good. We call them academic mobility and networking. We were able to visit four German universities, one in the South, uh, two in the West, and one in the North. And we learned the technologies that they use in tech, in robotics or industry 4.0, which we are able to bring back home and be able to show the way to the young scientists or the young girls and, and women in research. Next. 
The other perspective is membership in ICT communities, membership in working groups, and membership in societies. Uh, when I'm teaching my students, I always ask them, uh, do you belong to the computer society or the society they have scores it in the school of computing? That is the first step to take. If you are in engineering, which group do you uh, belong to if it's a society? Are there any communities? There's the Oracle community. There is a Microsoft community on campus. There is the Cisco community. Do you belong to any? So these are avenues that um, girls and women can be able to participate so that we can, we can grow in tech and in ICT. And uh, the benefits are you get to participate in conferences and workshops that are organized by these ICT communities and societies, both local and international. You do your networking and you learn more. Uh, you make contributions in terms of innovation. You build capacity to be able to be a better mentor and you get to work with the industry players like we are doing today with Oracle. And there I put a picture, this I, I got to participate in a summer school at MIT in system dynamics. And um, these are all ladies, when we, 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 when we got there and there was a game, uh, we call it a beer game under system dynamics, we said, oh, I think it is a great opportunity that we, we made it, the ladies. And so when we were forming groups, we decided to just form a lady only group and play the game. And one of the participants there was expectant and she had traveled all the way from Asia. Despite her being expectant, she made it. So despite your situation or your scenario, you can be able to participate in this, which are very rewarding. Number six, or is it five? Yeah. Okay, that was another participant. And we were so happy that you were at MIT, such a prestigious university. So the ladies were all taking turns to take a picture in front of that great building. And we were just happy that we made it because uh, we were members of the System Dynamics Society. So it's important to belong to local community, ICT communities, international communities, because you get to participate in the conferences. That is the only, when you are members, you won't be given trouble of getting visas. You know, you want a visa to go to the US, you, you can travel anywhere in this world when you are a part of these communities, because you would want to participate in conferences, in workshops, when you appear at that visa place, where are you going? Uh, invitation letter, here it is, and there are no questions. And you are going to present something. So you get to travel, you get to have fun, because you are a girl, a woman in ICT, and you, you, you can make contributions in these societies. The other picture has Koli Islands, that is in Iceland. Uh, it was another conference for the System Dynamics Society. So how in my imagination would I think I'll go to Iceland <laughs> or the city of Reykjavik, Iceland University. So it gives you opportunities to travel, to get to know what other people are doing in your field and you learn a lot. Okay. Um, collaboration with industry tech partners and consumer partners, uh, the likes of the big guys like Oracle, IBM, Cisco, the government, uh, those in agriculture, because we, we are talking about ICT for development. You know, when you bring all these people around, we encourage our students to find time to participate. So thank you, Oracle, for this session. Thank you, Dr. Chemwa, for supporting women in ICT and our director. You know, without their support, uh, we wouldn't go so far. So we thank the men in our midst who support girls and who support the women in ICT. So these collaborations give equal opportunities, equal training opportunities like uh, 
our sister Bekere has said, it doesn't say only men, no. All the girls, all the women have equal opportunity. Equal opportunity to take competitions if they are there. Collaboration in curriculum development, which is important so that we can prepare ourselves uh, to fit in the marketplace. It provides us opportunities for networking, for mentors and building capacity. And then we have the subsidized certification programs which we can be able to run on campus. I think I'm finishing. Um, what we have done in collaboration with the industry partners, we get uh, that picture there, those are IT students uh, whom we had gone with to South Africa for quantum computing. So we want to be at the front of technology. So whenever we get opportunities with uh, industry tech partners, this time we were being sponsored by IBM. So being able to train, you can see the number of girls there. Uh, I think there's only one, one gentleman there. So giving equal opportunities to girls in tech and women in tech to be at the forefront of technology as it unfolds, uh, very important. Those I will explain in, in pictures, women and girls in computing consultancy, and research projects. Sit down and write those proposals. Girls and women, so many opportunities. When you write your proposals, when you compete on the global uh, scale with everybody, and when you win that proposal, that project, or that funding is usually very uh, satisfying as a lady in ICT. So you get to travel, you get to be sponsored. Like now, this one is a personal experience um, which I uh, participated in proposal writing with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. For the first time, I got to travel in first class. And I got somebody get to pick me from the airport to the hotel, you know, all those nice things. And also participate in blockchain for supply chain, which is tech that is unfolding that we can be able to participate in. With so those so many words, <laughs> thank you for listening to me and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Dr. Agnes, for that very uh, inspirational and informative uh, presentation. I've personally learned a lot about the resilience of women and how far they can go despite some very uh, challenging circumstances. So we appreciate even that uh, sharing with us because it has helped us even to identify how to uh, plan and how to adjust and to make it despite the odds. So uh, at this moment, you are going to be going to another session where I'll invite uh, the moderator, Ms. Waso, Sheila. She's going to be taking us to the next session. I know we are a little bit uh, behind uh, schedule, but we shall definitely learn a lot in this next session. So welcome, uh, Sheila. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. So as we start this session, I'd like to ask all of us to stand up. If you're joining us on Zoom, I need to stand up but before we do, we request that you check that you have trousers underneath. I know sometimes you forget, right? We are going to make a pledge because this panel discussion is going to be very short, but we really want to know what or what does it take to actually break the bias, you know? So this is what you're going to do. We are going to do this the pledge to break the bias. Now, as we do this, I want you to think in your life as a man or as a woman about any instance or any bias that you have or you've had. It could be conscious, it could be unconscious. Think about that bias and think about how you broke it or how you plan to break it, all right?
All right, I'll give us 30 seconds to think about that. 30 seconds. I hope you're thinking about something because I'll, I'll be asking that we share some of this. I think it's very important that even as we talk about breaking the bias, we think about how we contribute to these biases as people who have these biases, but also how we don't control or how we don't correct other people who have biases. You know, as women, you could be at work and probably it's a fellow woman or a fellow man, a colleague who has a bias against a certain um, gender equality issue, a sort of stereotype, but we still keep quiet and move on uh, like there's nothing happening. So it's very important that we have to realize that we take the responsibility that we should. Well, thank you so much. You can sit. My name is Sheila Waswa. And I think I'll just introduce my panel to join us before I can also introduce myself. As I said, this is going to be a very short uh, discussion. And also, this is the session where we'll probably open up to the public in case anyone has any questions, you can actually uh, put them across. If it's on Zoom, please use the Q&A uh, to just ask your questions, and then we can see if we have enough time, we can be able to answer them. So for our panel uh, session today, we are going to be having a list of four very powerful and resourceful uh, panelists. Our first panelist will be Dr. Agnes Mindila, the lecturer in the Department of Computing. Dr. Agnes Mindila, uh, kindly welcome to the stage. Our next panelist will be Marion Karanja, the Principal Technology Solution Engineer at Oracle Kenya. Marion, I'd say, just looking at that title, before I saw your name, I already thought you were a man, <laughs> you know? So that is one of the biases that I think, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking that from, from now, I'm breaking that. Our next panelist is Bekere Amasoma, uh, Oracle Academy Program Manager at Saharan Africa. Bekere Karibu Sana, that is what we say in Swahili. Karibu. Karibu. <laughs> Right. Our last panelist, and I think it's great that we have a, a gentleman in the team, is Dr. Geoffrey Chemua, Lecturer, Department of Computing, Oracle Program Coordinator, JQuad. Karibu, Dr. All right, so as I said, we're going to, as I said, we're going to make this very short. Uh, we're going to make this very short and resourceful, and I think we'll just start with Mario Karanja. The simple exercise that we've done, you know, think about a bias that you probably have. It could be conscious, which means you are aware that you have it. It could be unconscious, which means that it's just a stereotype, you know, that comes once in a while. If you had it and you've broken it, please tell us how you broke it. If you're still working on us, probably share your journey with us, right? Thank you very much. Um, that has caught me unawares. So I'm, I'm looking back and before joining Oracle, so I, I headed a department, which means I had to recruit. And this is a very conscious bias, which I, I always employed that if a lady applied for any tech role that was out there, I went ahead and made sure that she got the first interview because I believed that I wanted to give that. It was a bias because I always looked at the, at the sex, you know, like I wanted to know, is it a male, is it a female application? So that a female application, you know, vastly move them to the next stage. But later I recognize it's not only about taking the lady and pushing her, it's also ensuring that we are of equal measure. So as much as it was a bias, I, I still believe it's good to, to front those who put their names in that in that um, hat, given that, you know, most of them are not getting that opportunity. Most of them are not uh, fielding themselves. And when Bekere was talking about how they're adding value, so now Oracle is creating a playing field for everyone. So I feel like I am breaking, I am, I'm still breaking that bias mentally whereby I feel like women need to sometimes be given that opportunity, that platform to just go. But with things like what Oracle is doing with the Oracle Academy, um, yeah, 
it's it's a bias that I have to work against and to work towards and ensure that instead of just letting people fly in, it's something also to do with um, encouraging people on the other steps, developing themselves and also ensuring that um, ensuring that we have that um, playing field. Yes, just to add something else, I, I also have this bias that I need to take care of everything that is in the house. So that's totally different. <laughs> and I'm learning, I'm learning that I can get help. I can get help. I can get help to get my bedroom done because the hotel room, something happens in the hotel room. That's a bias I have to break. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, uh, Mary and Amanda, for sharing that. And I think that that is very important. From just the discussions that we've been having to learn from the presentations, I think some of the things that I picked, one of course is um, you just ask me what is the worst that could happen when it comes to you know women, whether it's applying for jobs or going for opportunities that they may not even feel desired. Um, and also just being intentional in terms of, of what you're doing. And you know what, what I'm getting from that food. Um, you're talking about breaking the best because the problem is actually not the fact that uh, they don't qualify, it's the fact that something is not pushing them to actually apply for those jobs, you know? You don't have to see uh, a, a job that is when there are women encouraged to apply for you to actually be able to apply. So thank you very much, Mary, for sharing that. And just before we let you go, because I, I know you have another engagement, Please share with us so that we can experience what in a somewhat male-dominated field. Is it still male-dominated? Every day is an experience. Let me, I've laughed and I said every day is an experience because sometimes people don't expect you to know as much as you know. <laughs> and um, being in Oracle and the fact that the support that we get at Oracle, it makes it much easier. But as I said, my journey hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy because I've entered meetings and um, you find that you're the only lady even before joining Oracle. And there's the, already the stereotype of, I should know less. That's, that's not it. I have trained developers. You can imagine being a manager and at the end of it all, you're, you're sitting with all of them and showing them this is how your code should look like. And this is what I, I recommend. So it's not been easy, of course. People think you know less, but the best thing is always believing that you know. And then when you prove people wrong, oh my God, it feels so good. So that's <laughs> that's something I feel all the time. <laughs> and yeah, I I have to leave. Um, I have a client presentation right now. So I'm very happy that I was part of this. And um, thank you for inviting us. And Bakere will talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mara. We're going to miss you on this panel, but I know you have yeah. to go. Thank you for honoring the invite and see you some other time. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mara. And that is Mara Karaja, the principal technology solution engineer at Oracle. Please clap for her as she leaves. All right, now we go on, Dr. Agnes Mindila. Um, during Dr. Agnes' presentation, there was something that stuck out for me, that mothers should also teach their children, or train them from very young, or introduce them not to their ICT, or in some sort of way, breaking the bias. And this reminded me of a book by Chimamanda Ngozi Odichie that talks about um, how to raise your daughter as a feminist in future suggestions. And one of the suggestions that they gave me um, that was very interesting is as mothers or as women, and also generally as parents, when you have a daughter and a son and you take them to the supermarket to go buy toys, what happens? You take the girls to the pink shell, you take the boys to the blue shell, right? But the other thing that will happen is you nudge the girls to pick up toys which are either ladylike, so kitchenware, um, dolies. That is true, right? And then you nudge the guys or the boys to actually pick up toys that are what's your speaker is minor. So whether it's tools, sorry about that, whether it's tools, whether it's cars. Um, and, and that is actually one of the stereotypes that I think is very ingrained in our society right now. 
Dr. Nudu. Uh, I don't know what you would say has been your role in sort of trying to change that stereotype in the society, not only just as a woman, but either as a mother, an aunt, or even a lecturer who is potentially a mentor to your students uh, in the ICT field. Uh, thank you, Sheila, that observation and question, I must say that uh, um, I was a victim of that unconscious <laughs> stereotype where you have your daughters go to the shelves to pick the uh, really like toys, and you have your boy going to pick the mango ones, like the cars and all that. Uh, at that time, I did not realize that. I was engraving something that would really affect them. Uh, but I, I reformed and changed my ways. <laughs> they grew up, and uh, as a mother, as you say, uh, I encouraged them to, to pursue their dreams in tech. Uh, both of my brothers are in tech, and uh, what I do as a lecturer to my students, uh, both undergraduate or postgraduate or whatever area put upon to serve as a mentor or instructor, I try to play the same to my own mm -hmm. and tell them, give them examples. If I have very good undergraduate students, I'll tell them about them, what they are doing, what they are venturing in, in whatever fields of tech or AI, uh, blockchain, quantum, and I will share with them my experiences and what they are doing, where they are going, and in that way, encourage them. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mingila. In her own way, and rightly so, right now, despite the initial, you know, <laughs> at the beginning, I think you are changing the world to be a better place by breaking bias. Dr. Joe Hitchamo. Can you understand to this panel? Thank you very much. Now, my question is actually around imposter syndrome, you know, the feeling of inadequacy. And this is something that a lot of women mention, you know, they don't feel like they're able to do this, they feel like imposter in this specific field. My question is that it's a very curious one. Do men also have imposter syndrome? Okay, sorry. Thank you for that question. I would like to say that um, psychologically, as people grow up, they are normally affirmed in what things that they are doing and they are pursuing. Mm -hmm. And uh, your question relates to how the girl child is brought up. Mm -hmm. So that uh, you find that uh, sometimes they have to look to a second party all the time to affirm them and to tell them that what they are doing is right and they should continue. While the male child is uh, led out there to go and fight with the world <laughs> and discover for themselves and affirm, you know, amongst the, themselves, uh, get, get that affirmation amongst themselves. But what I can say is that um, it is a mentality issue that uh, is actually implanted in a person how do you become confident in what you know and what you can be able to deliver? It's very, very important. And I believe that as uh, our children grow up, we need to be able to give them that uh, affirmation, let them be confident that they can, yes, learn from us, and two, also learn on their own and be able to perform to that level which they are required to perform as long as they have that confidence of finding out uh, truth, truth it, which is universal and which can be applied to anything. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Chimo, for that. I think I've never thought about it in that manner. You know, most of the time, just yeah, we are women, so it happens. So when you think about it in terms of the social construct and that, what that makes us to think or believe about ourselves, it really makes it seem like a non-issue, you know, and I think that helps in, in actually conquering it. All right. Bekere Amasoma, how are you? 
I'm doing well, thank you, Sheila. Good to see you again, and I love you. Afrocentric. Can you hear me now? Um, have you unmuted? Just one minute. Yes. Can you hear me now? We can hear you right here. Can you sign up? Very as the Oracle Academy Program Manager of Saharan Africa, I'm sure you've had a lot to deal with biases, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> you please share with us one situation that you're like, oh my God, this is good. Oh, wow. Well, so, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say I'm lucky, but no matter how lucky you, you, you get as a woman in these things, some people will still try to test you. <laughs> so, um, so most times, or if on a few occasions though, so because my name doesn't easily give away uh, my gender, um, when I send emails, I get addressed as a sir. And I just expect in this time, if somebody you don't know emails you, you can, could just easily, you know what, Google up the person and Google up images to see whether it's a man or a woman first before, you know, the assumptions, right? But in it's not the case sometimes with me. Another thing is what I've noticed that is a bias is that most people, when I come to them and say, oh, I'm the Oracle Academy Program Manager, they tell me, oh, no, I want to speak with your boss. And I'm like, I'm the manager here. In this region, <laughs> what do you mean by you want to speak with mine? So, no, no, I can't talk to you. Can I talk to your boss? Can I talk to a man? Um, I've gone to a meeting where um, it's so, so, this particular one was so, so heartbreaking for me. And the person told um, some other of my partner to say that, is she the one with the budget? Why, why is she the one with the money? Why? I thought she's the. I thought we were bringing in the ogre in Nigeria is, is like boss. I thought we were bringing in the boss to the meeting. I didn't know it's somebody that still reports or she's still going, you know. And I had to, to be honest, it was very tough for me to. <laughs> my emotions wanted to come in place, but I had to keep them in check. And I'm like, you know what? What I do these days is to. I think my competence would speak for me. I don't need to explain myself to you <laughs> anymore or something so i've had issues where they tell me go and call your boss go and call a man i can't talk to you and i'm like what does that mean have i in any way not proven my competence to you that you want to talk to somebody higher you know go and call the person who would sign the check and i'm like i'm the one outside the check i do you want to go <laughs> do you want to Further this discussion or not. So I would say I've been a bit lucky, but you can't totally um, take away these things, especially um, at this side of the world. So, so some people are dressing me as a star, you know, uh, until we get into calls and they see that it's a young, it, it's even, it's even worse because you are young. <laughs> it's not just a woman, it's worse because you're young. Do you mean you're the one? That, no, I don't want to speak with you. So those are some of the, the, the challenges I have faced. But mm -hmm. I keep I keep moving on because the work we're doing and the work we still have to do is a lot. And I'm focused on the goal and I don't allow um, all of those things to weigh me um, down. Well, well, thank you so much, Vicky, for sharing that. And you know the other thing is sometimes you think it's 2022, these things are not happening when they actually are, you know and in such a big scale. So I think I'll just like before probably we go to a, a round of call to action, get any questions from the audience. Any questions from the audience? Any questions online? All right. Um, is there one? All right, um, can I have them? Thank you. 
So my question is um, on the area of mentors. So several speakers have mentioned mentors. And uh, of course, there are some do's and don'ts pertaining how do you identify a mentor and how do you approach this mentor? And what is the role of the mentor in the career woman? Probably. And also maybe uh, uh, while well, they're still uh, students, how can they identify these mentors and how do they put them All right, all right. I think um, a question is specifically how do you identify a mentor? How do you approach a mentor? And what will be the role of this mentor? Uh, in your life, either as a student or as a career woman. Uh, Who would like to take that first, Dr. Chemo? Okay, thank you very much. I would like to say that uh, that's a very, very important question, and especially now that we have Oracle Academy on board. Um, one of the deficiencies in our African education system is that we lack proper mentorship of our students. When you go out there uh, in other countries, young students start interacting with the industry at a very early age. And that is where they develop the relevant skills to see the gaps existing, and later on they develop solutions for their societies. So what we are asking is that uh, uh, even companies like Oracle, please, we need even a closer collaboration to see how we can intertwine our education system with the industry. Mm -hmm. We want our students not just to be consumers of technology, but to work on the problems that Oracle is having, for example. Can we have an Oracle lab in JQuart so that our students can start working uh, on real life problems and by the time they leave campus, they have those core skills uh, for the industry. Let me just stop there, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tari. Um, I think that is actually a, a, a very important point, you know. Uh, rather than just interact with technology, we must see how we can uh, solve our day-to-day -day problems with this technology. Because if you think about it, uh, the amount of time students, for instance, just spend on a day, how many hours you know, on Facebook or on Instagram, without actually thinking about how this can be used to aid us solve a problem in the society, or coming up with a new invention. So I think that would be very important. Like probably um, this for future reference, you can you can actually think about it and see what are the ways that you can have either an oracle lab or something like that, you know, so that these inventions can uh, can have a, a safe space for such inventions. Any other question? Okay, one. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Shen. Yes, sure. And my question is directed to uh, mm -hmm. uh, talking about uh, uh, breaking the mass. Uh, she had an experience with my children mm -hmm. uh, concerning toys. I'm a young parent and I've had such an experience. I have a woman like that. Mm -hmm. And the guy who, uh, when she started playing with toys, I would buy her toys that belong to a guy because I think she's like that. Mm -hmm. But it's like she defied that. So she was like, when you're going to the supermarket, it's like she's, uh, she's more attracted to the, the cars and all that. Mm -hmm. So I, I really had a big fight uh, on that. And I was not able to understand. And in fact, also, when she was young, I bought it for five months. Mm -hmm. She was already interacting with the phone. So, uh, how can you advise a young parent, or how can a young parent be able to identify mm -hmm. how to break the bias in a child, uh, depending on their gender, mm -hmm. at the early age, so that there is not like that conflict between the, the parent and the child? Mm -hmm. yes. All right, um, I think that's a good question. Uh, before probably Dr. Manila takes it, I think Shell, the first thing should be that you should not have a conflict with your child by trying to decide what that child was. <laughs> as long as it's not illegal and it's not harmful, let that child be. Dr. Manila, take it away. Thank you, Shell, for that question. Um, I think you started by saying that you took them to where their toys for the girls were. 
who told you that those were toys for girls? <laughs> I, think, I think then as parents also, we, we have also been conditioned in that way, like uh, Dr. Che was saying, because in us, we think that these are supposed to be for girls and these ones are supposed to be for boys. So we should reorient also as parents to know that a guy can, can whatever they want to choose to do, let them let them do it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much for that. Okay, now a call to action. Today, as we're talking about the role of ICT or gender equality for a sustainable tomorrow, what are our individual call to actions or what responsibilities do we feel we have? Uh, to actually break the bias. So from where you are seated, what do you think is the way forward in order to break the bias, and especially in this ICT industry? Um, would you like to go first? Sorry, could you, um, sorry, could you take a question again, sorry? All right, so my question is, from where we are seated or in our capacities in the different uh, organizations that we come from, what do you think our role is uh, in order to break the bias? You know? <clears throat> Okay, so I think one of our role will be to, for all of us in this room, is to um, advocate for more, um, you know, women in STEM so that um, we were able to, you know, break this bias. We should be able to um, advocate for more of women's achievements uh, to be celebrated because I feel that some of you know our achievements are not celebrated enough. I think it was on Saturday. I was at a glo I was a glo I was at a global mentoring work by Vital Voices, and I was just thinking to myself. He said, "You know what? Do you know that a lot of inventions were actually done by women? Uh, you know, groundbreaking inventions, but we don't get to hear about them. Nobody's celebrating them. Uh, but it's, when it's done by a man, of course, it is blown. You know, and all of that. So I think we need to." Um, um, market women more because I, I feel that about marketing, it, it's not the best product that that always sells. It's the most noised product that usually sells. So we need to advocate for for women, you know, to come into politics, to come into governance, to come into you know STEM, and that's the way we gradually we'll be able to you know close this um gender divide because it, it happens you know there's a lot of gender divide even in terms of pay parity you see in some companies you see some women paying some men paid for the same role you know they are being paid men are being paid more than the women just because they are women and guess what these women even work more than these men but because for the singular fact that they're just women and they pay them you know um lesser so we must begin to start to advocates um, for more women to come into this field and also celebrate the achievements of the women who are even doing like the, even the basic things, we must, we must start to celebrate um, them more intentionally. That will help to break the bias, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much for that. And, and, and that reminds me because actually what you're saying goes in hand in, uh, hand, in hand with, women are very humble about their achievements. You know, they don't say it themselves, they don't shout it, you know. But a man, because I'll give you a very simple example. We do a lot of projects in country that we see who is here. And once we go to that project, um, in the evening, country just this we post it on Facebook, right? Yeah. Uh, I posted that because my picture is there, but really I'm not posting it on my Facebook page. You know, then at the end of the day, then you expect when you're going out there to actually pitch. Uh, they are still calling the missing. They did not see me. So I think women have to intentionally be loud and proud about their achievements, who they are, and whatever they are doing. So thank you so much, uh, Bekeri, for, for, for saying that. I think that you can actually uh, break the bias. Uh, Dr. Mugiva? Uh, mine would be to break the bias. I think we have to be intentional, as uh, many speakers have said. And I think we should look at it as a supply chain. You know, when you're looking at the supply chain, you start from the very source up to the very end. So we have to be very intentional. And uh, 
in our country, the curriculum has changed, and uh, I think we have to accept that it has changed. The CPC, uh, when we traveled to Germany, what was what we took away from the trip is what we, they call cardboard engineering. You don't have to really have the real budgets that are so expensive, but you can, you can introduce engineering to a child at that very low level with some, some, some cardboard, so whatever materials that can be found easily in the environment and teach them that engineering or the ICT or the robotics with whatever they have. So we have to be very intentional from the very beginning, be able to identify that talent, be able to, be able to identify the girls who are interested in tech and science and give them the support that they need all through, all through at every level. Yeah. All right, thank you, Dr. Mingino, for that. Dr. Chimua. Thank you very much. I think uh, what uh, uh, Bekere, Madam Bekere and uh, Dr. Mindila has, have said, has, has summarized what I would have said, uh, especially many African countries today are introducing the CBC curriculum. And the idea is that we need uh, in that curriculum introduce ICT skilling and STEM as early as possible. So I think in one way that is going to solve the problem, but of course Africa has many other problems that need to work uh, in line with that so that uh, we can have a better Africa. We look forward to a better Africa uh, in line with the, what we call the um, Africa Union's Agenda uh, 2063. We hope that uh, going forward we shall be able to overcome the current challenges that have been uh, putting us down here. All right, uh, thank you so much to our panel for the time and the commitment, and also to our audience for sticking with us up until this time. I am I have been your moderator. My name is Sheila Waso. I am the CEO of Chasing Mavericks. Chasing Mavericks is a business connector company. Ideally, what we do is we connect brands to brands, businesses to businesses, business to people by creating platforms. So in other words, I'm an event organizer, all right? <laughs> okay, uh, at this time, I'd like to hand this over to the MC who will be uh, introducing uh, the guests who will be doing the closing remarks. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Shima. Let's give them a better clap. And also for our participants, uh, those who are here physically and those who are joining us online, thank you so much. It's been a very informative session for me. How many agree with me? Yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. So um, we are almost coming to the close of our event today. We are grateful to Oracle Corporation, Oracle Academy, uh, for making this possible. And you've uh, gotten, uh, I'm sure you've each gotten a take home or something that you challenge yourself to feel. Uh, for me, I think the, uh, the role of the woman in ensuring uh, that uh, It's not Dr. Chemwa. My apologies. It's Dr. Lawrence Nderu. He's the chairman, Department of Computing. Karibu sana, Dr. Nderu. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, participants, the guests, and the panel, I'm very grateful for giving me an opportunity to say something. I've been attending the event online. Uh, I didn't know that, Dr. Mindira, you are such a good storyteller. <laughs> I've been listening to the, the, the whole story and it was very impressive reasoning. You know, storytelling is one way in which you capture the, 
the spirit of uh, everything. It's everybody enjoys stories and that was great. I'm very uh, impressed also on what uh, Bekere has offered around the question of what Oracle is, is doing. And all the other speakers who have presented ideas around the question of inclusive, uh, including everybody on board and bringing everybody on board. So I'm uh, including even the director's speech around the question of what can we do as individuals and as institutions or even as communities to make sure that nobody is left behind. So my uh, comment in relation to the theme uh, for today is on the ideas around AI and data science and looking at what Africa is not contributing towards data as a general. Now think about women. So think about Africa itself is not contributing. The, the whole idea is that algorithms, methodologies, and all those things are going to influence a lot of what we do going future in, in this space. And that would be terrible if Africa itself is not contributing towards that. So our women are also not contributing as such. In terms of data, we need more. I mean, they are, but I'm saying we need more. We need more of our people all over to be engaged in those areas, the data and such. And, and therefore, I'm so much supportive of such an event, trying to bring on board people who think that it can be done differently. We can bring, it can be done differently. They are made it. We have women who are engineers. When you talked about the, the structural uh, design that exists in our, on our roads, and I use that road as well, and I can tell you something that uh, took me uh, to structural engineers in what I've seen in, 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 in other movies and such. And Yanni, I mean, the story was just well done, and I enjoyed it. Uh, that's why I'm saying I was able to follow and connect dots. So I think my challenge to Oracle is that um, I would want you to think of um, us as partners that we can work together. And specifically, I want to, because I know um, companies are establishing research centers in universities. And that's the theme that is now seems to be emerging in the 21st century, uh, research and training. So I would want uh, Oracle to figure out how they should be able to establish as well a, a linkage. As a department, as a school, we want those kind of connections where our people can benefit from uh, these technologies and the opportunities that exist. Whether it is a research lab, where even if they come with a theme around supporting women or something like that, we will uh, we'll find it, or even gender uh, issues around gender parity and all that. So that would be something that uh, I would put um, to Oracle to figure out how, I know we have access to resources, the Oracle Academic Initiative and all that, we are able to get uh, a lot of resources and, and that's interesting and we are grateful for that. But I think we also need to take this relationship further. Thank you so much for uh, those kind of offers. Now, mine was not to say a lot, but I have ended up saying a lot because I felt that the event captured my theme. Mine is just to say thank you. So I want to thank the organizers, uh, Dr. Chemwa, uh, for pushing uh, through the organizers from the Oracle group and for organizing, for agreeing to partner with us in this event. I also want to thank the panels, the, the panelists who have presented their experiences and done a very good job. Dorothy, by the way, I didn't know you're also such a master MC, MC sorry. So <laughs> thank you so much for a job well done. And uh, uh, we are excited that we have all that talent among us. I think maybe some of us are the people who ripped up their hands. Ripped up their hands and stuff. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much also for uh, joining. I think you have been very silent on that corner. <laughs> but it is good that I see everybody here. Thank you so much for coming. We hope that the actions that we have talked about, the, the here, the impact should start at an individual level, communities, and also where we work from. And I think for me, I want to assure you that um, inclusiveness is something that uh, I'm very passionate about. We want to have everybody supported and included. Thank you so much and have a good uh, afternoon. Well, thank you so much, Chairman. So let me just quickly add that um, in terms of um, the research debate labs, we have the Oracle for Research program, which I would um, gladly introduce your, your school to sometime maybe this week or next week there's an oracle for research uh, team 
that can hopefully set up a lab in your school. So I think we should take that up. And thank you for um, mentioning that. I have noted it and we will work towards it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen, for that. It's a good, good opportunity for us as a university to even get our research, to get to partner with you as industry to advance the course of the university. Thank you very much. And uh, we've come to the close of our uh, event today, but just prior to that. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Uh, I was just saying that we are almost coming to a close and uh, uh, Sheila led us through a certain um, activity whereby we made a pledge and each and every, I'm sure each and every one of us uh, followed the instructions and actually made a certain pledge that you're going to break you know, the bias in a certain field and work on it. Uh, the only uh, problem usually is when we want perfection, but even if you make just one step towards the goal, it will be good enough. So let's keep working on it. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Lona uh, Karibu Sana. She's here with us. Karibu. Uh, so this is uh, the moment where we say Koheri and uh, we thank everyone. I don't know whether Bekera, you have something to say before we close? Absolutely. I, oh, if I have to start thanking everyone <laughs> for putting this together, we would not live here today. And it's so amazing that um, I'm sitting here in Nigeria, in Lagos, um, still working from home, by the way, and we are putting together um, such an amazing event over there in Jacob. I wish I could fly there, <laughs> but not yet. Hopefully, we can do this, you know, again next year to commemorate this day. And I want to say thank you, thank you to Calvin of Ascenti. Thank you so, so, so much. I know we fought a lot over this, <laughs> but it's fine. It's so, so we will have a good program. Thank you, Dr. Chemwa. Thank you for uh, keeping up this, uh, you know, uh, keeping up this relationship over the years. You didn't start with us today. You've been with us for at least five to six years. I would say a very big thank you to the directors, uh, to Dr. Kimwele, to the chairman, to um, uh, the, the, the female doctor, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, the presenter, and to you, to Dorothy, to, to Sheila, to uh, Lona, to Maureen from J uh, Global Peace. I would say thank you. And most importantly, to the audience, thank you so much, because if you didn't come, we cannot be talking to ourselves, right? So thank you so much for uh, to everyone for, for attending and for putting this together. And hopefully, hopefully, I would come to Jake Watt and say, you know, thank you again and come for another event. And now we'd like to uh, end our event and uh, let's just bow our heads and, and pray. Our Father and our God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the event, the successful event we've had. Thank you for the milestones that we've been able to achieve as institutions, as individuals. We pray that even as we live, as we go out to our daily lives and to our various goals and aspirations, that you shall be together with us. We thank you for the opportunity to work with Oracle Academy, and we pray that, my Father, these avenues will be to the good of our students and the various participants and even for the institution that is Oracle as a partner with us, Jehovah Lord. We pray that you shall help us that this um, to be mutually beneficial, God, and to the glory and honor of your name. We thank you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Calvin, you seem to have something. Okay, so there's an announcement. The Global Peace Foundation will be having some uh, registration. So kindly see Maureen after after this event. So I want to thank uh, I want to thank everyone who joined us both online and here. God bless you so much. That brings us to the end of our event today. Thank you. And there's lunch for those who are here. Bekere, there's lunch. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna eat all of it when I come. Caribou, <laughs> Sana, Kenya. Caribou, Caribou. Bye, everyone.
Let's have a good photo, please. <laughs> For those who are here, we have a good photo. Let's have a good photo. <laughs> to make very so much so that we utilize the stairs. <laughs> Yes. 